you're not hearing Will, but I'll repeat briefly what he said, and then I'll move from there. Um, basically, uh, I'm talking right now to a group of people who are at the University of Washington, Bethel. I think I might have said Bethan before, forgive me. Um, and uh, they're interested in how to use social media within a class, thinking about teaching and learning. So let me speak to some degree to what we did at Mary Washington, what we're doing, and what are some possibilities, part of which I think you're seeing now. Um, I'm Jim Groom. I'm an instructor. No, I'm not. I'm an instructional technologist. I play a uh, professor on TV. How funny that I can actually say that and mean it now. Um, but uh, what we've done at Mary Washington has been interesting, um, and I want to talk a little bit about it, and I want to start talking about it with the link I have on the TV here. You can go to that link. It's UMW Blogs. Um, UMW Blogs is what we like to call an open publishing platform, and in this way we can even qualify that with an open educational publishing platform. It is a system we've created here that is run on WordPress multi-user, or what is now WordPress multi-site, and what it provides us is it provides us a pretty powerful platform to allow anyone on campus with a UMW mail, email, that's student, professor, staff, whoever, to create a site, to create a space um, that they can use for teaching and learning, that they can use for administrative announcements that departments are using to get out information about scholarships, colloquia, whatever it is. We've used this as a platform that actually allows for us to communicate across the campus. At any given semester, we have about 60 or 70 classes at Mary Washington using the blogs as a way to kind of communicate with their, with their class. Um, they have students blogging their work. They have professors who are tracking that blogging, who are also blogging their work. Um, we have a pretty dynamic community. To give you an idea of how dynamic, we have 4,500 students here at Mary Washington, which is, you know, fairly a small school by many standards but we have over 6,000 users on the blogs and over 5,000 blogs. This semester alone, we've gotten 1.4 or 1.3 million page views on this system with 500,000 visitors and 350,000 of them that are unique. And one of the things that's interesting about this, and I think changes the dynamic a little bit, is that we've used social media at Mary Washington along the lines of thinking about platforms of engagement and discussion, but also of thinking about the idea that what you do in the classroom reverberates in this kind of eternity of the internet. And it's not simply about hand in the paper, go about your business. It's actually about creating and molding an identity online that starts and is managed through your experience in the classroom. And I think social media is very much about both that engagement and that shaping of an identity. And I don't think enough universities take seriously how powerful it is to engage and allow students to frame that and understand that they're framing that within the context of a classroom. Now, one of the things we've seen as a result of that, and this has been exciting and it's something that came out of UMW Blogs, I think, is that we were allowed to let students, um, well, not allowed, but we figured it out technically, to allow students to map their own domain onto a UMW blog site. So if you've used WordPress.com, you've seen this before. Um, basically, you have a WordPress blog and you get the domain jimgroom.net. You're like, you know what, I have the blog, but I want the domain. I want that unique identifier. I want that unique address. Well, we allow students to map their domain on their own blog. And what has happened is it's become a space where they aggregate the work they've done in various elements of their um, college career into somewhat of a portfolio a resume, whatever you want to say, and they frame it. I'll put in the chat, and I'll even say it here, it's laurafalcon.com, and I'll put it on Twitter, and I'll also put it on, in the chat. laurafalcon.com is actually a student's blog, which is now a resume portfolio that's being run on UMW blogs, but also it's an aggregation, right, of all the work she's done in various classes here at Mayor Washington. And that's one of the things that's amazing about social media when you think about it for teaching and learning. If you do social media out in the open, 
as a university, what you start to realize is the work that's being done crosses over with other classes. Students start talking about various classes they're a part of, whether it be in the blogs, whether it be on Twitter, which I'll get to in a second, um, whether it be they're putting their stuff out there on Flickr and YouTube or whatever it is. That stuff starts to emerge in a conversation. And what becomes apparent is the life of the mind at a university. And through aggregation and RSS and all this stuff, you can make it apparent for anyone coming to your university or coming to your main page. If you'll notice, um, if you go to umw.edu, one of the things you'll notice about that is UMW Blogs is featured on the front page of that site, which I think is both very courageous of UMW, but I think it's also very smart. Because what it gives anyone who's coming to school is it kind of you know, says, look, this isn't your average brochure. This is an example of the scholarly work happening, of the teaching and learning happening at Mary Washington, and the implications of that are, I think, astounding. Because we're not hiding behind the brochure that's trying to sell diversity or sell our beautiful campus or sell some other idea. We're letting the students and faculty and staff speak to that idea. And we have the ability to, to focus and feature that work, which I think is very powerful. So, I mean, one of the things we've done at Mary Washington that I think is powerful and um, I do think has some legs is this open publishing platform. And I think it really does um, speak to the possibilities that are pretty, I mean, let's talk about the details here. And you can ask me specific questions through the chat on Illuminate and I will actually respond to those. But let's think a little bit about what it takes to do this. Well, to create a site on WordPress or UMW Blogs is, you know, like writing an email. I mean, it's dead simple technology. The interface is beautiful. Um, it makes for that idea of support very, very um, manageable for an IT group or for an instructional technology group like mine. The other thing is that it's cheap. Now, it's not cheap in terms of people which I like, because you want to invest in people, not in $250,000 in servers and infrastructure and all that nonsense. You want to externally, ex uh, externally host it, you know, cost you a few thousand dollars. You know, once it gets bigger, maybe twice that, six, seven thousand dollars. But you can invest in people to do the teaching and learning. You can invest in all these other things that are far more important than the stuff, right? And I think one of the things we've found is that UMW Blogs is scaling enterprise-wide. It costs us about $7,000 a year to host it and manage it. And they pay people like me to make it relevant, right? You know, and I think that is really important. And it's especially important for an IT group that is already swamped with other stuff they have to do. You know, one of the things is if you have a good IT group, and I pretty sure you do at Bethel, if I know the university you're talking about. Um, you have folks who are into open source, who can do some awesome stuff. It may not be a big deal for them to host it, right? But what you do need is you need professors and instructional technologists are there at willing and ready to experiment with it. And I can show you a bunch of examples of people who have experimented with it in terms of stuff they've done. An example, and I'll put this in the chat on Illuminate. Yeah. I can. Okay. Um, the question is, to what event, to what extent do teachers need to be invested in this technology? And, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think that happens overnight, and I think that really does change from professor to professor, even from student to student. I think one of the things we've seen, and one of the things that's made it powerful, is that we never said when we, over, we rolled out UMW Blogs, here's a great social media tool. No, what we said was, here's a great way to publish your stuff online. It's easy. It embeds media beautifully. Um, it allows you to link out to other sites. It allows you to pull YouTube videos in, image from, Flickr's in, from Flickr in. And when they realized that, they realized that these are resources they're already using online. These aren't resources that are kind of alien to them. I mean, I, there's no professor out there that YouTube, one of the greatest social media sites ever, 
is using it regularly for their classes. Often Flickr, they're using images from Flickr around the web regularly for their classes. This is not stuff that's outside of their purview. What we did by creating UMW blogs is we just created an environment that they could use and we could get them familiar with. So their investment, I think, in social media will vary. But the fact is, most professors, and I think there was a stat I saw on Twitter, don't quote me on this, over 90% of professors are using social media to some degree. Now, to what degree is a whole nother question. And, you know, Twitter, I think, really puts you, or even blogging regularly, puts you at a different level of investment, right? The idea of using the social media as a kind of consuming tool to pull it into your class and to frame what's happening um, in a particular topic, that's one thing. But to be constantly framing that as part of your own progress and your own blogging, well, that's something. That's something else altogether. And then Twitter, that almost instantaneous relationship between the student and the professor, well, that's, I think, a whole nother level. Um, and I think what we do at Mary Washington and how we address that is we talk to the faculty about here are the resources out there. Here are how you're already using them in teaching and learning. Here's how the blog presents a kind of landing pad to frame all that for a course and to manage that technology or to manage that social media in such a way that you can use it and then also allows you to produce on top of it and frame a resource. And that's one thing, Will, to get to your question directly, um, is we have a bunch of faculty now who are using this stuff as a way at the end of their course to create a lasting resource of stuff they've done in the course. Um, for example, we had a history class taught by Professor Jeff McClurkin, and it was about, um, it was called Adventures in Digital History. And one group of those students did a specific site dedicated to historical markers all around Virginia. Well, actually, not all around Virginia, but in our local area. Virginia's crazy with history. They go nuts with it. I live in Fredericksburg. If you know anything about Fredericksburg, the Civil War happened here twice, right? Um, and it's an ongoing event in many ways. And we did, or the students did this site. It's Fred and Markers, F-R-E-D-M-A-R-K-E-R-S dot umwblogs.org. It's a site that students created which actually documents all the historical markers in this area, writes up all this like, interesting history of it, a bibliography, and it's a highly visited site. It's a site that people from all over the community use, and it's a resource that lives beyond the class. I think it's the fifth uh, link if you search for historical markers Virginia in Google. And that's another thing is that professors and students alike start to realize that this publishing platform we've created as the basis for the conversation has brought all the work they do to the fore in Google because we have this unbelievable community who's constantly blogging, which means their Google juice is through the roof. So when they start to realize this, and they start to realize the possibilities of what they're doing, and how other people can find it, I think it changes the dynamic of why you use social media. But not through me telling them, you have to Twitter, you have to blog, but through the demonstration of, here's a publishing platform, watch what happens when you use it. And that's been effective. And it's also cause, nice because it's not pedantic. It's not me telling them what they should do, because you don't want to tell a faculty member what they should do. They work long and hard for what they're doing now. Um, and they'll do it as they see it work. And Yes. <laughs> I hear you. Will. Sure. Absolutely. No. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in no rush. Okay, good. Good question. The question is, how do students respond to the social media? Is it easy? Do they struggle? Um, how do they deal? Probably associated with that is questions of, is it private? Is it public? Um, and I think it varies just as much as it varies with professors, with students. Um, 
One of the things is, you know, students now, they use blogs so regularly as a part of UMW experience that it's almost part of the fabric. Um, they don't even think twice now about it. Most of them already have an account. They're using it. Um, and they figure it out pretty quick. I do this, I'm the single site of support for UMW blogs, and I get maybe a question or two a week about how to do this or how to do that. So it's, you know, 4,000 or 6,000 users, and I'm actually, it's not predominantly taking up my job in terms of them using it. Now, there's questions about how many of them want to use it. Well, you can always get a struggle if a professor comes in and says you got to use blogs and you don't follow through on that, right? That's the thing. I think the students who see the most value in it is the professors who build the blog or Twitter or whatever social media they're doing into the very fabric of the class. That's the difference, is the idea that what you're doing with social media makes sense. You're producing a resource for someone out there. You're building something that you know will live beyond the class. And, um, or, even not, you are building something that will engage and bring the conversation of the class to the next level. So it doesn't only have to be a resource. It could also be about engagement. But for that engagement to work, the in professor, first and foremost, has to be engaged. Like it, Gardner Campbell, who you've already heard from, used this great example, and I'm gonna actually steal it from him. He was like, well, if you were a professor, and you came into a class, and you were saying, okay, this week, uh, we have to read Scarlet Letter. I've already read Scarlet Letter. It's kind of a good book. I mean, you know, I'm not crazy about it anymore, but you should really read it. Well, that's what professors often do with the blog or the Twitter. You know, hey, you should do this thing. Everybody's doing it. I'm not interested in it. I think it's stupid, but it's probably good for you. I mean, what student in their right mind will do anything with that? They'll laugh. They'll say, ha ha, I don't have to do it. They're not into it. Bam, it's done. The investment in this has to come from the source for students to be excited about it. And I think that investment has to come from a professor who sees value in it, right? Who sees ways and imagines ways. That's the thing. Anyone who's going to start doing this, this is an open playground. You imagine your course or one small part of your course of how you might use social media in some interesting ways. And you know what? You frame a whole nother level of this game. Because right now, it isn't defined. It's not defined cleanly, for sure. And it's chaotic, and it's messy. But it's a part of what we do as teachers and as instructors and instructional technologists is imagine the possibilities. For too long, we've been stuck within systems that have imagined the limits of those possibilities for us. And I think it is our obligation to actually think beyond that. And who better to do that than professors? I mean, that's what they do. They know their subject inside out. Now, how to bring that subject to different communities, to different possibilities, to engage around the resources that are all around the web, well, that's what the social media tools are for. They're basically to amplify a professor's vision and amplify a student's voice and come into terms with that vision. It's, it's an amazing process if you think about it like that. I mean, it just takes it all to the next level. Um, and to me, that's what's exciting about it. So I will say, you know, students, I mean, when they see value in it, and what we've seen, we've had UMW blogs going for four years now. What we've seen is over those four years, we have many more map domains. We have many more students who are actually archiving their work and taking it with them when they go. Um, we have many more students who understand that this is an invaluable kind of archive of the work they've done that can be easily transposed into a portfolio, a resume, and a kind of digital notebook that they take with them. And they've done, many of them, a lot of work. And the portfolio, I think, really reflects that. Um, I'm going to put a couple of portfolio links into um, the Illuminate session, and hopefully Will can share them out wherever else you are. But here is a good one we just set up. Um, and this is a portfolio that's running on UMW blogs. Um, and here's another one. 
um, that is a student that has graduated a while ago, and you'll notice just how much this is a portfolio. Um, it's not any sign of anything else anymore. Um, and so there's just two examples, and we have hundreds, literally hundreds of students who are doing this now, who are taking control of their own domain, taking control of their own identity, and a university in this day and age should be thinking about that. How do we allow students to take control of this data, to manage this data, both locally and on the social media, and frame it as a part of their experience that they can take with them. And to me, you know, that's an essential lesson to learn from this process. Yes, Will? Perfect. Yes, I have more than time. That's all I time because I make no money, so I got plenty of time. Um, okay. Um, one of the things DS106, uh, DS106 changed my life, um, and I can say that honestly because um, DS106 was a class I've taught for three semesters now. I started in the spring of 2010. I taught it again in fall 2010, and then I did something different this semester. Um, You'll have heard of, I think, this idea of the massive open online course, which is really kind of innovated by Stephen Downs and uh, George Siemens and Dave Cormier and another number of people. But they're the ones who really, I think, got this going. Um, and what you'll see with this, well, you know, David Wiley did it um, back in 2007, if I recall. Um, so anyway, there's a long history there. It didn't start with this, for sure. Um, but one of the things about this is, is I have a class I teach at Mayor Washington. I teach a face-to-face -face class. I lead, teach an online class, 25 students, 25 students. And then I teach, well, I don't teach. There is an open online component that anyone can take. And I was a little afraid. People had recommended I did this for this class because I did the class on, I had it going on Twitter. I had it going in the blogosphere. I had it kind of open anyway, but I didn't officially say, hey, anyone could take this class. So when I did it in December, I was a little afraid because I figured, you know, the worst possible case is no one takes it and it's a failure. But then I was like, well, it doesn't matter because it's open and online anyway. So what we did is we basically just announced, hey, if you want to take the class, follow along. And then we redesigned the class in some key ways. And what we did, and luckily, and this is a point, I think I'll go back to this point before I move forward, because it's probably the most important point of the whole thing. Why did this massive open online course, in my mind, and I don't think the massive is important at all. Let me just go on the record saying that. Um, why did it work? Well, if it did work, and it's just about over, and I think all intents and purposes, there was a lot of success there. Um, it worked because I had a network. It worked because I had spent years and years cultivating a network uh, through the blogosphere, on Twitter, Flickr, etc. All these other places. F amazing how many people came to the fore and actually contributed to the class and in many ways made the class crowdsourced. Really did. And that crowdsourcing of the class is very interesting. And one of the things we did, you can go to ds106.us to see the class. You'll notice there's a link there that says submit an assignment. Well, that was one of the most amazing parts of this class. I'll talk about DS106 radio and TV in a second. But the submit an assignment to get this thing started, people who were not in the class starting December 6th, was, was more than a month before the class started, started submitting assignments and doing them. There were 200 blog posts for this class before it even started many of which were animated GIFs. And Tom Woodward and Tim Owens got right into that, and they started populating assignments in the visual and design categories. People got excited. People started doing this. There was already a kind of momentum for the class moving into week one that was really established. And then the students came on and they said, what the hell is happening? This class is already happening. And in some ways it was. And 
for me, that was exciting because you really allow anyone to submit an assignment and do it. And then other people can do it. So if you go into that submit an assignment part, you look at the visual or the design, you click on one. If someone has done it, all the examples of people who have done that, core, uh, that assignment show up. So it's an amazing repository of assignments for digital storytelling that are crowdsourced and that once you do them and you tag it right, could be shown up there. Now the DS106.us site is an aggregation model and it's what I spent most of my career as an instructional technologist working on. Although I don't want to scare quote instructional technologists, I love what I do. Um, but what has happened is we actually said everybody get your own blog, use a tag like DS106, and then submit your blog URL on the sidebar. You submit it, and anything on your blog you tag DS106 will automatically republish on this site. So it's an aggregated feed site that shows you everything that anybody associated with the course has done for the course. Right now there are more than 3,500 posts of people all over the world who have submitted assignments or who have done assignments. And it's really been amazing to watch that. Now add to that, which I think is already cool, second week of the course, I have this kind of throwaway tweet basically saying, hey, it would be really cool to have a radio station for DS106. I know nothing about setting up a radio station. I know nothing about web radio. I know nothing about web TV, frankly. Um, let's do a little kind of, um, and I'm going to put the DS106 uh, URL up there now. I'm too caught up talking. I'm not doing enough managing of my TV show. Um, Let's, you know, and then Grant Potter, who works at UNBC, he actually came up. He said, hey, I can do a radio station. Yep. Will, are you talking to me? Uh-huh. No. Absolutely. Okay. So... Um, deadline, two minutes. How do I do DS106 radio and DS106 TV in two minutes? Well, I can. Here it is. I tweeted it. Grant Potter and all his awesomeness set up a server using Icecast and this thing called MyAutoDJ. He put up a Dropbox. Anyone could submit music. Anyone could submit files, whatever they wanted, and it would automatically program it into the radio station. Immediately, we had 24-7 radio. Then he started figuring out how we broadcast to that radio station. How we, and we could do it through our mobile devices, we could do it through our computers. It became a freeform radio station that was programmed and published by the people of the DS106 community and beyond because people who had nothing to do with the class jumped into the radio station. Same thing happened for the TV. And you can't do this in a closed course. This can only happen as it's premised upon the network effects of something like this. Tim Owens, who came around, he did much of what Grant Potter did, but he did it for the TV station, which is what you're watching now. This happened for people who were professionally doing professional development for e-learning, instructional technology, online learning, teaching, etc. This was something that was keen to them, something they knew a lot about, but also something they could bring to the table for a community. And what has happened is DS106 is not a course anymore. The course will go away. What it is, is a community. And it's a community that owns the vertical and the horizontal. And that's really important, like the outer limits, right? We got the TV, we got the radio, right? We got the blogosphere, we got the Twitter. We have a social media empire where a community can kind of communicate and elaborate on not just what they're learning, but who they are. And the fact that every university doesn't actually engage this is insane to me. Because this is what is at the heart of a university like ours, a small public liberal arts university, that idea of contact. Now, if we're going to move towards open and online learning, how else can we do it more effectively than as a community, than as a group of people working towards a common goal of making the world's knowledge and education available and open to anyone? That's what we should be doing. That's what we're paid for. That's why we have public funding. All right. That's DS106 Radio, that's DS106 TV, and that's Jim Groom. <laughs> awesome.
Yes. They will, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Take care. Awesome. Okay, so that is it, ladies and gentlemen, for the Illuminate session. And thank you all at the University of Washington Bethel. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I am actually going to clean up the Illuminate um, and DS106 TV, obviously, and DS106 Radio. Sorry I did this as an experiment in broadcasting. Um, I don't mean to be a hog on the feed, but it's 1240, and I'm going to give it back, but not before I say DS106. For life! For life! <laughs> All right.